so uh, really so excited to have um, Sean Carroll here with us today. And uh, what we're, the format of the morning is um, going to be very dynamic and I, I know you're going to enjoy this. I had the privilege of uh, taking a look at Sean's, um, Sean's book uh, about a month, month and a half ago. And I have to say it is, uh, he has created a new genre and I literally sat down and took it in in one uh, marathon read. Uh, he, he, this book, a series of fortunate events, which is coming out, I guess, in, in September, Sean, what's the pub date? O October. Uh, October. It, it, he simultaneously tackles the most fundamental scientific questions and the most consequential philosophical questions. But he does this um, with just, I mean, he has an unrivaled ability to create metaphors that are, are meaningful and um, relatable about very um, high level scientific theories and um, that really connect to daily life. Um, I, I, it's, it's hard to actually explain what he does except to say uh, that the humor and the use of these connections, um, I've, I've just never seen in a book like this. Just to give you a couple of examples, I mean, he pivots from um, a typo in the copy of, of, of a 17th century um, King James Bible, a little, a little typo, to um, the mutation that is responsible for HIV, uh, the virulence of HIV. He looks at, he, he takes hundreds of millions of meteors that are circling around the solar system and um, likens the um, one penetrating the Earth's atmosphere to um, spermatozoa penetrating an egg. I mean, these are just wonderful um, disciplinary spanning, uh, uh, the things that he does. And um, all of that with so much humor. Uh, I will tell you that the, the treat at the end I don't even know if I want to spoil it, but let's just say that the people who appear in this book will surprise you. Um, Seth Farland and Albert Camus um, within the same paragraph. So um, it's such a pleasure to um, introduce Sean. I think this introduction is probably unnecessary, but um, he is an evolutionary biologist, a writer, and a film producer. He leads the Department of Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute which is the largest private supporter of science education activities in the US and is distinguished university professor of biology at the University of Maryland. Uh, he is also professor emeritus of molecular biology and genetics at the University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. His scientific research has centered on genes that control animal body patterns and play major roles in the evolution of animal diversity and more recently on the evolution of molecular novelty. He has authored six books for general audiences, including, and many of you have read these, The Serengeti Rules, Behave, uh, Brave Genius, Remarkable Creatures, The Making of the Fittest, and um, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. And of course, his forthcoming book, A Series of Fortunate Events. Uh, Sean is the architect of HHMI's documentary film initiative and head of its Tangled Bank Studios, has served as executive producer um, and on-screen presenter for more than a dozen feature films, including Mass Extinction, Amazon Adventure, The Farthest, and Oliver Sacks, His Own Life. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean Carroll, and um, who will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to just open it up um, for a dynamic Q&A. Thanks, Barb. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I think this is the first talk I, or conversation I've had in this kind of format. So uh, enjoy the novelty. Didn't know who was all going to be here. Uh, some of you know more about me than I'm comfortable with, but um, you can take your shots later or in the chat part uh, as it might be. Um, so I really appreciate this. I'm, I, I wasn't counting on people were going to do the reading. I want to explain that both those pieces were really for general audiences. One is for an upcoming article in the Atlantic and one is a chapter out of the book. Um, because then that might even lead to a discussion of how we talk about some of these ideas, you know, in general audiences. Because I think this idea of chance is not only hard for people to get their heads wrapped around, but, um, you know, pretty uncomfortable philosophically for a lot of folks. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background that overlaps with the reading, but you might find a couple of, you know, factoids in here that um, you didn't read as I give you the background. And I, I think I framed one central scientific discussion where I sort of hope you'll just have at it. You can, you can aim it at me, but you can also aim at each other because I think I'm going to throw out um, sort of a question that will be fodder for, for everybody to join in on. So I'm going to try to share my screen here 
and hopefully get this all right. Uh, here we are. Share. Let's make sure that this behaves. Come on now. This should be. Uh, let's see this slideshow view. You all seeing that as a typical cover slide for a PowerPoint? Yep, looks good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the central question we're going to deal with is the creative role of chance and evolution. And I think the context of that will, will come out. Um, it just so happens this is the 50th anniversary of Chance and Necessity, if you know the book by Jacques Minot. And not by my arrangement, but by publisher's arrangement, I'm actually going to come out 50 years almost to the date after Chance and Necessity. Um, if you happen to have read anything, if you've read Brave Genius, which I wrote, you may know that, that Jacques Minot has been a lodestar for my scientific career for about 40 years. And about 10 years ago, I was able to really dig into his story, meet his family, meet all sorts of people who knew him, worked with him in all sorts of contexts. And that's what fueled one of the pieces I gave you to read. Um, but I'm gonna give you a little more background about, uh, about Minot. Uh, so you get a lot of understanding of just why was he so compelled to write about, think about, um, talk about chance. So um, Jacques Minot is a, one of the most famous in biology as, as a Nobel Prize winner in, in molecular bio, in, in physiology or medicine for as being a founder of molecular biology. And he worked out those first principles of gene regulation, primarily with Francois Jacob at the Pasteur Institute, uh, but he shared the Nobel Prize um, also with Andre Lavoff, who was a, a pioneer in understanding bacteriophage. Um, he uh, was also sort of the, a principal creator of the idea of allosteric and the idea of the regulation of protein activity, how small molecules could regulate big molecules. Um, and he did uh, serve as director of the Pasteur Institute um, late in his career. Now, so, you know, an eminent person, but I can tell you that if you met Jacques in his 20s, uh, none of this greatness um, would have been on your mind. He was really, uh, he really struggled in his 20s after getting his bachelor's degree to sort of find his path in life. And that's because he was interested in, in lots of things. Um, and it was really, uh, I think one of the themes here is that there was a big element of chance um, that allowed his, what I believe is true genius um, to flourish. Um, and I'll get to that element of chance in a second. But Jacques was interested in lots of things. He grew up in Caen on the coast, uh, southern coast of France. Um, he was interested in natural history when he got an offer to uh, go aboard a, a ship to explore Greenland in 1934 with a, with a famous French captain serving as ship's naturalist. He, he jumped at the chance and here he is with um, native Greenlanders. Uh, but he was interested in lots and lots of things. He, he um, made his way to California to study genetics in Morgan's lab in 1936. But uh, by his own admission, and certainly by the person who invited him there, you know, he didn't accomplish much, um, but he did enjoy rock climbing. Um, and he was always interested in music. So he actually uh, wound up directing a choir while he was a chorus, while he was in uh, Pasadena. And really the question was, would, would Jacques focus on music full time or on science? And um, he decided science. So he returned to get his PhD at the Sorbonne in zoology. But um, at the time, like a lot of French people in the late 1930s, um, he didn't have a very clear picture of, of the future. This is a letter he wrote to his father on August 31st, 1939. Just a little excerpt where um, the winds of war are blowing across Europe at this time. And he says, there will be no war. Hitler is much smarter than Wilhelm II. He knows what it would cost him. I only regret that the English are too polite with him. They should not have bothered writing him long letters. They should have told him to piss off without any further explanation. Well, it was the very next day that Germany invaded Poland. And you don't need to hear all that dramatic, dramatic stuff. But it was then months later, after the so-called phony war, that um, uh, Germany invaded France and Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg. And at that, by that time, Jacques had left the lab. He was 30 years old, so he had always done his compulsory military service, but he did not want to get caught in, a, in sort of a rear administrative position. So he signed up for a regiment of engineers, communication engineers, and he wanted to use his scientific skill. He anticipated that war would break out. 
And he also knew that this regiment was stationed in Versailles, close to Paris, where his wife and newborn twins lived. So it was um, when he was at stationed in Versailles that the invasion eventually came. And as you know, France fell very quickly. And so when he and his family are eventually reunited later that summer back in Paris, the scenes around Paris were shocking where you know, all of the restaurants and hotels had been uh, taken over by um, the German army. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my clicker here. Um, the you know, troops marched on the Champs Elysees every day uh, singing. And while Parisians stood in long bread lines and, and there were not enough calories really for, for everyone in the city, um, you know, the, the German army was, was quite well fed, at least you know, beginning in the, in the fall of 1940. Uh, Jacques was one of a relatively small number of people who, um, you know, of course, extremely upset at the course of events, decided to join the fledgling resistance, which at the time was really just a matter of sharing information. Um, the media was dominated by Nazi propaganda, so uh, BBC was a really important source of information, but not everybody could get the BBC and it was illegal to do so. So they came up with the idea of just a newsletter that they would uh, copy and circulate among like-minded folks. Here's a copy of that first newsletter called Resistance. And just to give you some sense of the flavor of that, uh, here's, here's an excerpt translated. Resist. This is the cry that comes from the hearts of all of you who suffer from our country's disaster. This is the wish of all of you who want to do your duty, but you feel isolated and disarmed. Resistance is here to speak to your hearts and minds to show you what to do. So this is just a couple months into the occupation. Jacques is back at the Sorbonne uh, trying to pursue his, his PhD in zoology, um, but at the same time with the circumstances in, the, in Paris and in the country so radically changed um, and sort of seeing what in fact the occupation was gonna mean to French life and French freedom. Um, this was the, just the beginning of the resistance. Unfortunately, just as this first copy was sent out, mistakes were made. Um, the uh, stencils essentially for this first copy were shared with a few young um, aspiring flyers, French flyers, they got caught. And on them were some, uh, were some information that um, the authorities got a hold of. And in interrogating these individuals, they came up with this list of names. And if you just comb down this list as I will, uh, about 15th down the list, uh, there's Jacques Minot with his address, the Laboratory of Zoology at the Sorbonne. And what this list of names is, is a, is a bunch of people who were supposed to get copies of this newsletter, this resistance, um, essentially one page, or, you know, one sheet. And uh, as you can see, Jacques was supposed to, he preferred to get it between two and three in the afternoon and to get 20 copies. And uh, so the authorities immediately raided all of these, all the labs or addresses on this sheet and on another page. Um, but fortunately, the copies of that newsletter had not reached Jacques either at his lab or at his apartment. And he was, you know, with no evidence on him, uh, there, was, there was no further charges, no further investigations. Um, one of his friends was not so lucky. Uh, Leon Nordman, who was a fellow music lover with Jacques, uh, a lawyer and who kind of got Jacques into this group um, was found with much more incriminating evidence. And Nordman was one of seven who were among the first resistance who were executed in uh, February 1942. So Jacques learned a very, very hard lesson of that you know, security was going to be really important and anything that they would do and that um, the stakes were going to be extremely high. Uh, nonetheless, after he wrapped up his PhD work, he joined then what was the most militant branch of the resistance, which was that um, run by the Communist Party. Um, this is his ID card from uh, the summer of 1944, where really, unfortunately, by a process of attrition, the people above him in the resistance were being captured and deported, and Jacques kept getting promoted to where he, he held the rank of commandant in the resistance, because everybody had military service. The resistance was very well, or was organized along military lines. And, and Jacques was in the operations bureau and he worked on uh, sabotage and other sorts of missions like that um, with his colleagues. This is I refer to as his, he kind of is his Willem Dafoe looking badass photograph. 
Um, and you may see through the blue stripe here, it says Malavera, that's his nom de guerre, that everyone had, a, uh, had an alias because uh, lots and lots of people got captured and uh, you wanted to uh, hopefully not be identified by even your colleagues uh, who, who would be interrogated under, under torture. So sometimes you know, people just didn't even know each other's real names. Um, they, were, they were all aliases. Now Jacques' role in, in the resistance, sort of his responsibilities grew and grew. And in the course of researching a previous book called Brave Genius, I met his assistant in the resistance, a wonderful woman named Jean-Vievre Nouflar, who was a music student at the time in, in Paris. And jean Viev held on to some documents, documents that I learned were not in the National Archives in, in France, which I had searched for all sorts of things related to the story. And in that document, I learned that, that Jacques issued one of the most you know, pivotal orders of the, of the liberation of Paris. So I'm going to share that with you here. Um, he dictated this to jean Viev, and she kept it. This is on like the thinnest of you know, like tissue paper that it's um, typed out on. And what happened was Jacques, what, what the, the uh, insurrection began in Paris in somewhere around about August 18th or so. But Jacques was extremely concerned that the resistance were way outgunned by, you know, tiger tanks and all sorts of things that the German army had. And so he wanted them to change tactics to not try to just occupy buildings because he thought they'd be slaughtered, but um, to use a tactic that had been used in Paris for really two centuries. And so he asked uh, Neuflar to um, take down this order, uh, translate a little bit of it here, and he asked to that suggested they should build wherever possible, beginning with large main streets, barricades that are powerful enough to stop automobiles, automobiles, et cetera. And these barricades would be uh, uh, twisted and offset in a way that would allow the passage of friendly patrols. They should be defended by armed groups that would uh, have the job of um, stopping enemy vehicles and that the population should be encouraged to build these by means of posters and loudspeakers uh, on cars. And after he finished, um, uh, dictating this this order, he turned to Nuflar and he said, uh, you know, it's too bad this is going to be ignored. It, it, it might actually work. But but let me show you a scene filmed by the resistance within a day or two out on the streets of Paris. So in fact, the citizens of Paris did build the barricades, chopping down trees, digging up bricks uh, from the streets. You'll see the fortifications are getting better. They're haul, they haul out furniture, they hauled out cars for which they had no petrol left, sandbags, etc. You can see all citizens, women, kids, etc. A lot of these, bar these uh, barricades were built on bridges, which would be important passage points like this one. And behind the barricades were members of the resistance with whatever arms that they had. Um, additional arms they had, they had a, a type of Molotov cocktail that they used that were uh, manufactured in laboratories. I know I'm talking over the uh, dramatic video. Once you finish, you'll see it. There we go. So um, the Molotov cocktails were actually manufactured in laboratories and sort of sent through um, the underground uh, catacombs of, of Paris uh, to, to uh, be fed to resistance members in various, uh, out, out in the streets. And so that battle waged for several days. And finally, on the evening of August 44th, French troops, followed by their American allies, entered the capital. This is a newspaper, actually authentic um, copy of that newspaper, um, of one of the resistance groups called Combat from the official day of liberation of Paris from the 25th of August. And for several days leading up to the liberation of Paris, there were editorials. This is, uh, I'll show you the translation of this editorial here on the left side of the page. There were these anonymous editorials running in, the, in, the, in combat every day. And um, let me give you the taste of the spirit of Paris on uh, August 25th, 1944 from this editorial. Four years ago, a few men rose up amid the ruins in despair and quietly proclaimed that nothing was lost yet. They said that the war must go on and the forces of good could always triumph over the forces of evil, provided the price was paid. They paid that price. And it was only a few days later that the identity of this writer and of the staff of Comba uh, was made public. And that writer was Albert Camus. And it was for his role really as first anonymously, and then for about the next year in Combat for editorials that he became a national figure and essentially, you know, the, the voice and conscience 
of, of France. And you'll see why I let you know a little about Camus in just a second. So uh, Jacques continued to serve. He actually uh, served as sort of a, a liaison between the French and the American army. He was fluent in English. His mother was from Milwaukee. He learned English at an early age. So that was very handy in terms of first uh, in the military and later in science. Um, but once the war was over, he really wanted to hurl himself back into research. He had suspended all of his research to devote his time to the, to the resistance and his, his time in the military. And he told his first job applicant for um, now a position in his lab at the Pasteur Institute, he was in search of the secrets of life. And those secrets for Jacques were the questions of, you know, what are genes made of? Remember, this is 1945, right? We do not understand the material basis of genes. Um, and how do genes work to specify the properties of, of living things? And it's the pursuit of these questions that's going to um, lead him to a Nobel Prize. He comes over to the U.S. It's one of the first, after the war, one of the first opportunities for biologists interested in these questions to gather. They gather at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, many of you would know that Cold Spring Harbor is a, an incredibly famous place for biologists to gather. Here is Jacques um, chatting with Barbara McClintock. This first meeting of maybe 70, 75 people that are focusing on heredity, I think I counted eight or nine future Nobel laureates um, at that meeting. So the, the per capita um, intellectual firepower was, was pretty awesome in 1946. Jacques was energized by his first trip um, uh, to the United States and um, he visited the Rockefeller and various places on the East Coast, so much to just get material support for French science, which of course, you know, France had been decimated um, economically and in, in terms of infrastructure because of the war. And so things were looked really promising. And uh, in 1948, um, Jacques happened to read a, a uh, headline in one of the French news newspapers, proclaiming, as you see across the top, a great scientific event and talking about heredity and um, claiming that her heredity is not controlled by mysterious factors. And as Jacques, Jacques, is, Jacques is reading, he's thinking, wow, there must have been a really big discovery here. He hadn't heard of it yet. But as he read on, um, that curiosity just turned to horror because he was reading an account of a major meeting in Moscow um, about the issue of heredity. Um, sponsored by um, a Soviet Academy and led by um, T.D. Lysenko. And Lysenko had, uh, gal had, had uh, called this meeting to really reform Soviet biology. And the direction he was wanted to reform Soviet biology is one where um, his claims that traits could be produced by manipulating the environment and that those, and that those traits could be inherited, that that was the new Russia, Soviet biology and that Mendelian and Morganist genetics um, was erroneous and must be abandoned. And so when Jacques read this, right, you know, when we're sort of on the brink of understanding um, uh, a new understanding of genetics, you know, he was, he was really horrified. And um, he was invited uh, to write what turned out to be the one and only op-ed of his entire life in, of all places, um, uh, the newspaper Combat. And what he's going to address is what Lysenko is arguing. And he's trying to understand Lysenko's argument, uh, trying to work his way through some of the Russian. He got some help from Andrei Lvov on that. But the crucial dispute, as he understood uh, Lysenko, was that Lysenko is arguing, and this is key to our thinking here today, that because mutations are unforeseeable, they lack a material basis. They're, they're miracles. And this is, this is, in Lysenko's view, not science. So we need to rid our science of Mendelism organism. We rid it of chance. And Lysenko says that like, sciences such as those of physics and chemistry are, are rid of chance. And it's for, it's for this reason they become exact sciences. So chance is a crucial ideological point um, that Lysenko is making here in the Soviet Union in 1948. So Minot writes his editorial. It's carried on the front page of Comba. Um, Camus is no longer with the newspaper, but nonetheless, Comba's glorious history was, was certainly cemented by uh, those days that I referred to a couple minutes ago. So here's the article, um, uh, Mendel or Lysenko, and, and Jacques saying that the victory, Lysenko's victory has no scientific characteristic character whatsoever. And so he's arguing that um, 
Lysenko's truth is the official truth guaranteed by the state. His opponents who defend science are practically accused of treason or worse. Um, all of this is senseless, monstrous, unbelievable, a sign of the mortal decay into which socialist thought has fallen in the Soviet Union. Now we might find this as a you know, somewhat, um, you know, why, why such a big deal? Why front page and combat? Well, the front page is because the Communist Party in France at this time is very powerful, very popular. Um, the, the Communist Party really led the resistance in, in World War II. They really had the support of French workers um, and they had a really strong faithful um, obedience to Moscow. So Moscow is now saying you have to dump Mendel and Morgan and adopt this sort of Lysenko frame of view. And Jacques Minot is essentially saying, hell no. And that's at some particular risk because lots of the scientists around him are uh, members of the Communist Party. Uh, and some of his family members are, are members of the Communist Party. So this is a break, uh, a sharp break. And Minot gets swept into sort of in public debates and all sorts of things that are going on about um, the fate of communism and the, the sort of the, the quandary of either towing the party line or of, of supporting science. And in that process, he's introduced to Albert Camus. And this becomes a very important friendship to Minot. Um, Camus is at the time also having very uh, serious reservations, serious thoughts about the Soviet Union, about Stalinism. Um, and really the two men see, you know, Stalinism in the same way they saw Nazism, just another hollow ideology that was, um, you know, oppressing um, uh, the mass of citizens. Uh, Camus at the time was working on a book that would um, sever his relationship with the French left called L'Homme Révolté or The Rebel. And uh, I was really delighted to find between some of Jacques Bonneau's uh, unpublished writings and the actual text of Camus' book, a clear influence of Jacques Bonneau in actually what Camus wrote. Because the little quote that I have up here on the right, I don't think as brilliant as Albert Camus <laughs> was, I don't think he came up with this on his own. So in his critique of Marxism, he says, to remain infallible, it has been therefore necessary to deny all biological discoveries made since Darwin. All discoveries since have consisted in introducing the idea of chance into biology. So his, his riff there is, is, is about chance. And uh, just a little thing to share with you about the closeness between the two men. I was also delighted when I asked family members to look at Jacques' copies of Camus' books. Here's his copy of L'Homme Révolté and the inscription from Albert Camus above there where uh, translated, I've translated at the bottom to Jacques Monod, this answer to a few of our questions. Um, fraternally Albert Camus, but it was a relationship um, that meant a lot to Minot, and I found enough correspondence that I think it meant a lot to Camus, and um, it lasted 12 years until, until Camus' uh, sudden death in a, in a car accident. But that influence of Camus was something that drove me to write that book, Brave Genius, because I was struck that when um, years later, after his Nobel Prize, um, and Jacques wrote his book, his sort of essay on the meaning of molecular, the philosophical meaning of molecular biology, it's, it opens, his epigraph is from Camus' myth of Sisyphus. And in interviews, he cites Camus. So he's very much of a Camusian mindset. And I wanted to trace essentially what was the, um, you know, genesis of that relationship. Okay, so pivoting to sort of our main discussion today about chance, um, just want to give you a sense, why would, why would Jacques write this book? And I, he wrote this book because he felt that a lot of the public's view of science was really about emphasized technology and sort of the technological fruits of science. And he felt the most important results of science, as he said here, has to do with our relationship in the, our place in the universe and, and the way we see ourselves. And this is, of course, very, if you know any Camus, this is, this is entirely Camusian as well. And, um, but after, in this book, after about uh, five chapters or so of a little bit of philosophical background, a little bit of molecular biological background, he gets to the heart of it. And I just want to give you uh, one or two quotes from Chance and Necessity central to our discussion today. So Jacques, this is 1970. And, you know, so we're, you know, more than a century past Darwin, and he certainly is as every bit a Darwinist, but he wants to emphasize the role of chance. The role of chance 
beginning to be understood by molecular biology through understanding the structure of DNA, the molecular basis of mutation, and the nature of the genetic code as much as we knew in 1970. Of course, we weren't able to even sequence DNA at the time. So chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. This central concept of modern biology is no longer one among other possible hypotheses. It's the only one that squares with observed and tested fact. And nothing warrants the hope that on this score, our position is likely ever to be revised. And just to sort of rub it in, he says, you know, there's no scientific concept in any of the sciences more destructive of anthropocentrism than this one. So, you know, Minot doesn't really know what's going to happen. It's his first book. It's got these technical appendices to it. It's kind of got a lot of formal philosophical terms. And it's a bestseller. And if you read, I, it, it's, it, it's only number two to love story in France at the time, because after all, it is France. Um, so it, Jacques is then interviewed by umpteen uh, you know, media outlets uh, in France, in Britain, in the United States. I think he does two interviews with the New, with the New York Times. So for a while, this is quite a buzz um, as theologians and philosophers sort of join the discussion. And none of them can challenge Jacques on the empirical science. So more of the argument is sort of he's outside his lane as a philosopher, or you, know, you, you can imagine some of the counter arguments to this. And many books were written in direct opposition to chance and necessity. Um, uh, you know, at, at least a couple handfuls. Um, so, you know, 50 years later, where are you? Well, you know, what did Jacques know in 1970? He, he knew a bit, but I'd like to say that there's been major discoveries and advances, some of which not foreseen by anybody, that really underscores the chance nature of existence on this planet. Um, one of my favorites um, was actually reported 40 years ago this week, so perfect timing for our discussion today. Um, this is the original report uh, from uh, Louis and Walter Alvarez and colleagues of their hypothesis of the extraterrestrial uh, cause of the mass extinction 66 million years ago. This is the first evidence um, uh, with things like the iridium trace and things like that that led them to the thought that an asteroid struck the Earth 66 million years ago and, and caused a mass extinction. Um, I, I, I probably don't need to get into the details of that. I'm going to actually skip ahead two slides and just underscore sort of the chance nature of this. I, I like to refer to this, at least in the book, as sort of the mother of all accidents, because as we've learned more and more about this impact, um, you know, this is a six mile wide rock traveling about 50,000 miles an hour that drills a crater about 125 miles wide in the Yucatan. But it's the, it's not just the impact, it's everything that's blown out of that crater that has global um, ecological consequences. And that's a really destructive plume and it, it has to do with the mineral content of the rocks at the impact site. Um, and it turns out that only about somewhere between one and 13% of the Earth's surface contains sort of the right mixture of rocks, uh, carbonates and sulfates, such that when vaporized um, in, you know, and, and sent to the atmosphere could, could trigger a mass extinction. And the chance nature of this to appreciate is, you know, with the Earth rotating at a thousand miles an hour, that rock, which has probably been circulating the, the solar system for four billion years, you know, had it entered about 30 minutes earlier, 66 million years ago, lands in the Atlantic, probably don't have a mass extinction. Uh, if it arrives about 30 minutes later, it lands in the Pacific, and probably don't have a mass extinction. And of course, I think dinosaurs would still be here and, and we would not be. So um, we've learned a lot more about the chance nature of existence. And then with respect to DNA, which was of central interest to Jacques, but we didn't have much access to um, deciphering what was in DNA. You know, we now have the ability to essentially see mutations as they happen by comparing, for example, um, parents and children and counting up how many spontaneous mutations have happened um, in, in either germline uh, in, in, in the making of an individual. We understand that those numbers are somewhere between about 35 and, and 60 for, for uh, any one of us. So um, we can ex see exactly how this genetic game of chance is, is played. We can see the how random mutations fall in the genome, we can understand that in, it, mutations arise, of course, without any uh, consideration of their consequences on, on, on organismal function. Um, so as we've learned more, um, but I don't think this idea of chance has gotten the 
the traction that it deserves. Um, I, I took this on in, in this book, um, and I'm, I'm definitely, you know, speaking probably you know, largely to a non-scientific or student audience um, to, to prompt them to think about chance at these different scales. And um, so I appreciate the invitation here today. I gave you one chapter out of the book that I thought was, you know, more fodder for professionals than, um, than some of the others. And that has to do with our thinking about the role of chance and of, of random mutation in the creative aspects of evolution. And relative to our thinking, either currently or historically, about the contribution of natural selection. So just before I end here, I want to give us a couple of quotes to uh, launch us on a discussion. But, you know, reading Darwin, which, you know, and, and you know, for the record, there's, there's probably you know, no naturalist, no biologist I'll ever admire more than Darwin. Um, Darwin says, I can see no limit to the amount of change to the beauty and infinite complexity of the co-adaptations co between all organic beings, et cetera, which may be affected in the long course of time by nature's power of selection. So he saw natural selection as this all powerful mechanism. Um, and, and had some thoughts, we can talk about this, about the nature of variation, but it, it, he's, you know, he was certainly handicapped by the lack of knowledge of genetics um, in his era and the nature of heredity. And Minot was saying, you know, chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. So the little discussion point that I'd like to create here is, well, which of these two geniuses is right or more right? Um, Minot is saying it's chance, which we know he means that's really random mutation, and Darwin's saying it's this natural selection mechanism. <laughs> and I think it's interesting to sort of poll lots of professionals and just see where their minds are, because to this day, there's lots of working evolutionary biologists that are um, weighing in on this, I guess I would say. And what I try to do, for, at least for readers of this book, is give at least a, a little um, framework for thinking about this in the, in, in the process of innovation, the process of making something new or different in the course of evolution and of the respective roles of mutation. And I came up with this sort of staircase metaphor where the idea is that, you know, to change the state of a character, you, you, you need a mutation. But to change, of course, the frequency of that character, it's that process of natural selection. Natural se selection either propagates that change or not, depending upon um, the impact of that change on organismal fitness. But if you think about this overall process and the fact that it's cumulative and iterative, you, you can't get to a different character without mutation. Um, and, and of course, selection plays this role in terms of in, in the cumulative process. But I think that historically, because selection seems, you know, both sort of the, the one of the you know, central ideas of evolutionary theory, I think it's fair to say that historically that the creative role of mutation has been downplayed. We know there's a necessary role, but I think the idea was, well, those mutations are around in one way or another, you know, organisms will get there. But, um, you know, many prominent, uh, eminent evolutionary biologists have, have emphasized, no, the, the creative process of mutation. I think of Masatoshi Ne in particular, who, who recently wrote a book called uh, Mutation Driven Evolution. And I thought it'd be fun for the group today um, it would have been more fun if I had just polled everybody and said, what do you think, you know, makes a bigger contribution to innovation and in, in evolution, you know, mutation or selection, and you could all have at it. Um, so now I frame this for you and I've taken away that fun of the quiz. But I thought that this, the relative contribution of mutation, and therefore, you know, the more you think of mutation as being the creative fuel, um, then the greater the role of chance in your mind, or greater the role maybe in, in, in chance conceptually. So um, that's what I wanted to frame for our discussion, and I hope I have not consumed too much time in getting us there. But that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing, if that's possible. And do you know how I stop? Oh, there it is. Stop sharing. The red button. All right. So somebody, somebody, you know, start an alarm. Oh my God! Look at the time. That's okay. It was. Um, I that up. I didn't, I couldn't see my clock while this is running. That's terrible. My apologies. That really took too long. Let's rock. I'll shut up. We have many, many questions. The chat is just very alive. Um, I'm just going to, there are many things I'd like to ask. I'm going to limit myself to the following. Um, so Lysenko objected to, um, to the, the chance, it seems like not because it was incompatible with, with deistic 
you know, systems, which, you know, Monod was writing about that incompatibility, but more because he thought it meant that it, it was a false science because the unpredictability um, seemed, seemed so different than the quote unquote hard sciences. And, and I just wonder if, if what you were trying to expose as a kind of a, a, a fallacy or a false dichotomy between the hard sciences and the biological sciences and what we can learn from that. Of course, in the, thanks Barb, from the viewpoint of the 1940s, you know, of course, physics and chemistry were dominant and biology was just the infant. And, you know, of course, molecular biology was really sort of bringing physics and chemistry to biology. But no, Lysenko's objection was ideological. It was out of the Soviet view that essentially, you know, all things were malleable, um, you know, in, in any direction necessary, be they crops or humans. And that the idea that there would be some constraint hereditary or historical constraint was, um, you know, not acceptable. Furthermore, in sort of the Soviet Union, the, I, there was a big push to sort of Sovietization of all things, of all Soviet culture. And so uh, lots of inventions and ideas from the West were essentially purged and given a, now, then a Soviet sort of mythology. You know, everything from, you know, virtually light bulbs to genetics to astronomy. Um, was happening in the post-war period. So this was with all with Stalin's approval. Lysenko was awarded umpteen medals and all this stuff. He, you know, he was clearly Stalin's favorite because he was, you know, putting a total Soviet spin on the interpretation of nature. So it was, it was highly ideological. And he, and his, his argument about chance was that the traditional breeders and genetics in the Soviet Union in the twenties and thirties was terrific. And a lot of them emigrated, you know, when they saw the writing on the wall. Um, that the traditional breeders that were improving crops through this process were used to, you know, selecting random variant, you know, variants that would occur at random and breeding them together and cultivating new new crops. He saw that as all too slow, and he thought you could just do this, you know, very um, uh, essentially Lamarckian process of of modifying plants and by growing them in different environments, and that these things would be inherited. And so, you know, it was understood came to be understood. He was a complete fraud. His data was made up. The claims were, were, were total nonsense. Um, but nonetheless, it was, he ruled Soviet biology and Soviet agriculture for a long time, made a huge contribution to famine in the Soviet Union and then in, in China in the 1950s. So this, this little argument here had uh, lethal consequences for tens of millions of people. Okay, uh, Meredith? Yeah, so thanks so much for that. Um, so we've got a lot of great questions in the chat, but no raised hands at the moment. So if you'd like to verbally ask the question, raise your hand, uh, but we'll go to the chat for now. Um, so we got a question from Randy Nessie. Uh, Many previously neutral alleles are deleterious in modern environments, but are there examples of alleles fixed by genetic drift that harm health? And this is great because you got all more intellectual firepower on this screen than you're going to get out of me. So you guys have at it with each other. Let, let's, somebody can answer that question better than I can. Anyone like to respond to Randy's question? Okay, we were this, uh, see the F Club F Med's taking on a whole new, uh, or the conversation between the, the audience. Um, if there's a, quite a few people who are asking questions, would someone um, raise their hand and ask in person? That's on the, on the chat? All right, well, I will then, but please, uh, I see, I don't want to name names, but I have some bunch of friends on there. We'd love to, to see your faces with your questions. Um, Sean, how does CRISPR play into all of this? What would Minot say? And, and Well, as a, as a tool or as a mechanism? I mean, as a mechanism, I think you'd be fascinated with the biology and sort of the arms race that goes on that, you know, that, that, that understanding that arms race that, that led to the discovery of CRISPR. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it, 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 it weighs in too much here. I, I think that, you know, the, the, the question here is, and I can see, I'm trying to quickly also keep an eye on chat because people are asking, you know, is this a false dichotomy sort of between, you know, chance and selection? Yeah, I think we're just talking about different parts of the process. And I'm just going to make the, the, the assertion that I feel that sort of natural selection has dominated the discussion um, without a lot of thought to, the, to the, the fact that you sometimes can only get from 
a particular A to a B through particular mutations. Um, and therefore, uh, those innovative mutations have to arise. There's a big role of chance. If you look at something, an example I use in the chapter is the origin of antifreeze in fish, and it's a, you know, it's a deletion of a, of a larger gene that gives you a piece that can bind ice and things like this. You understand that's a creative mutation. That's, that's not something you can just build up from sort of infinitesimally small parts. And so, you know, I don't want to create any false dichotomies. I think it's just a, it's, uh, I, I feel, and there's a fair amount of literature, I think, that is, is worth digging into, that in the way we talk about evolution, you know, as change over time, and I think especially when you talk with lay people who have all heard of natural selection, I'm going to just assert that the chance nature of the mutational process is less familiar, and when you dig into it, almost, you know, a, a more powerful, let's put it this way, it's a powerful phenomenon for people to wrestle with. Because if you think about that contribution of chance processes in biology, whether that's, whether that's the sorting of chromosomes and meiosis, whether that's um, recombination, whether that's conception, um, whether that's, um, uh, you know, later, uh, the, you know, the way, you know, species may, um, you know, occupy territory or, split into populations, et cetera, then you know, people can understand there's a huge component of chance to the story of life. And I don't think that that element of chance is very prominent in people's minds. I think they've got the selection paradigm somewhat in their minds, although they often get it to think that's sort of the teleological interpretation. But I think that, um, and I did a fair amount of, uh, let's just say, focus group testing of this <laughs> this hypothesis, you know, with, with, with non-scientific folks or with students and the, and the element of chance had been, has been somewhat elusive. So I, I don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to make a big academic fuss out of this distinction. I just think that there's a historical reason why natural selection is prominent in people's minds and, 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 and probably the, the history of chance is a little bit shorter and it's probably not been emphasized as much in biological curricula uh, as natural selection. And, and for that, people are sort of missing this huge component to the, um, to the makings of life. Um, I can't talk and read very well at the same time. So somebody please spare all of your colleagues here and either ask a question or... Uh, I see a hand up with Antonis Rokas. So he's also got to start with a disclaimer that uh, he's read this book and he postdoc with me in the, a long time ago in, in Wisconsin. And, uh, and he has a lot of stories, but I have to tell you that some other day. Antonis, you want to go? Yeah, great, great to see you. Hey, buddy. Uh, <laughs> what a why pleasure. Do think, why do you think um, chance has been downplayed? Is it because of the, the obvious sort of consequences for religion, for our place in the universe? I, I think there's got to be, yeah, I think there's got to be an ingredient there. I, I think that, you know, e if you look at, if you ask, for example, the American public, you know, does everything happen for a reason? You know, that's a majority view. Um, the sense that there is something, you know, guiding every outcome, as I said, whether it's conception or, you know, or cancer or whatever, is, is pretty prevalent. And so at least going from the reaction to Minot 50 years ago, I don't think a lot has changed in the sense that, you know, people wrote books that said, basically said, if you allow chance in the picture here, quote, God is out of a job. So, you know, not my view, their view. And if you, if you perceive it that way, then you see chance as this threat to, to you know, a, a worldview. Um, Minot knew that. That's why I wrote the book. And he spends a lot of chapters talking about, you know, essentially um, discarding, you know, ancient myths. Um, so he, he had an explicit purpose in bringing chance forward. And I think there's, there's understandable resistance, but I think certainly as biologists and educators that we, I don't think we've elevated chance as much to its place. Cause if you think about chance in, you know, uh, asteroid collisions, or you think about chance in some of the just stochastic behavior of the climate over sort of medium time courses and things like that and droughts and all that, um, then you know, we, we got to understand that we're, we, we live on a really, um, you know, on a, on a planet that is, that is uh, careening through many, many, many random processes. 
Uh, yes, we have we have no good. I just want to, to respond to that uh, that that your um, correlation between the the oscillations of Greenland surface climate and the ventricular fibrillations of, of the heart um, are, is, is really, really a fascinating um, a connection that you made in the book, uh, which I, I enjoyed as a cardiologist particularly. Uh, Noga um, Aharoni? Hi. Um, yeah, so in terms of trying to quantify the balance between chance and selection, um, it's kind of a question for the crowd. Um, do we know if evolution optimizes for a rate of mutation that is more than minimal, that allows a high rate of a high rate of mutations and a high rate of deleterious mutations than needed, or does evolution just optimize for the lowest select the selection optimize for the lowest amount of mutations possible? Sure, there's folks who'd like to take that on. Anyone like to respond to Noga's question? I saw a hand going up. Ann McShay has a raised hand. Nope. Dan, do you want to respond to that? Um, I saw you were talking no, about No, I was that. raising my hand to ask another question. No, I can't <laughs> provide any help on that one. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I think if, if reframing the question a little bit, it, you know, we understand there's a range of mutation rates in, in organisms, viruses, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's been a lot of study of essentially what constrains those mutation rates. Um, so, and, I, and, you know, I think there's a lot of work on, you know, mutational load and, and things like that. So, uh, but I, I know there's people better qualified than I to, to sort of go down that. Shall, shall we circle back to that? We only have a couple more minutes. Sure. And, and, oh, sorry. I feel like I'm a, like a political, I feel like I'm like a presidential debate where I just dodged the question. I, I think we, maybe you're all going to get used to that in the next few months. Paul Watson has his hand up, I think, in response to the question, Nova's question. Shall we quickly have Paul and then Dan? Can you um, be our final question? Sure. Yes. Um, I'm waiting for Paul. Paul, go okay. ahead. We'll have your uh, response first. Thank you. Um, you may have already partially answered this question, um, but I'd like to give you a chance to talk about your view on how the extended evolutionary synthesis, as it's called, um, should be modifying um, how we think about the role of chance in the evolution of life. Well, I, I, yeah, again, I think there's, you know, probably the single most cogent and um, strenuous assertions are, are in Masatoshi Nei's book. And I think you would look at Nei as a, you know, as a card carrying evolutionist like everybody else. And I think it's to give more weight to mutation and more consideration to the nature of particular mutations in the origin of phenotypes. And um, so I think, you know, if you talk about the extended, of course, not everybody has the same definition of the extended evolutionary synthesis, but if you think that maybe what's mostly happened in evolutionary biology in the last few decades has been more of an emphasis on understanding the genotypic basis of change and of the genotypic basis of phenotypic change, then we're just saying, let's go a little deeper and let's understand um, the, the contribution of mutation in a little more empirical and a little, and perhaps uh, you know, more of an empirical way than perhaps theory gave us in the decades of sort of the modern synthesis. So I think it's considering, um, yeah, I think that would be the way I would put it. So it's, you know, we're not throwing anything out. I think it's a quite, you know, we're always in, in science sort of rebalancing how things, how large things loom or small things loom in our various heads. And, you know, my assertion for today anyway, until people talk me out of it is that, I think chance has been underplayed in our conversation about evolution and, and the significance of chance to understanding sort of the philosophical significance of what biologists have discovered. So of course I, uh, you know, Mano made that point 50 years later. I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just echoing it. Uh, Dan, can you, uh, Dan, thank you. Can you wrap up 
I miss our final question? Sure, I don't know if this is a wrap up question. We'll see. Uh, Sean, Sean, you've been talking about the role of chance in adaptation, and rightly so. I think you're dead on that it's been underappreciated. Selection has been understood to do dominate, uh, with chance playing a subsidiary role of feeding us, you know, minor tweaks to what natural selection can produce. I want to add and get your reaction to. Another role for chance, which is not in the production of adaptation, but in the production of diversity and complexity. Diversity, differentiation among taxa, complexity, differentiation among parts, both of which are expected to increase spontaneously simply by the accumulation of accidents, mutations, chance, chance accumulation of these things, totally in the absence of selection. Right. So I'm just getting your uh, So I, I've been very influenced. Um, you know, by, by various writers, particularly in, in, in seeing, you know, speciation, seeing essentially the, the branching of the tree of life as, you know, um, well, so when I say completely possible, I just mean as, as possible without the intervention of adaptation. In other words, that the accumulation of genetic differences over time is sufficient to isolate lineages. And um, that basically says you can have a, you know, a pretty dramatic branching tree of life um, without the intervention of, of selection. It doesn't mean those organisms, of course, aren't, aren't living under various forms of selection, but it doesn't mean that adaptive change is necessarily driving speciation, that there's a hell of a lot of speciation as a byproduct of simply this chance mechanism of, of generating genetic um, yep. divergence. And uh, so I was pretty excited to, to sort of encounter that in the literature. I, I, and I... Um, and I leaned on Antonis for this one a little bit because whenever I step into the realm of species, and, you know, I, I uh, you know, it's where angels fear to tread. I'm no angel, but it's where angels fear to tread very often. Um, so I think that's the view. I, of course, differentiation of parts is one of the things near and dear to me as a Evo Devo biologist, um, and I, you know, and I've been very influenced on your writing, Dan, uh, about uh, complexity, and. Um, Again, I think I just think of that chance mutational mechanism. And if you have lots and lots of repeating parts, you know, what an opportunity to differentiate those parts, right? My uh, colleague, Robert Brandon, has done an interesting back of the envelope calculation, which I think it's airtight, argues that 99.999% of all differentiation among tax over the history of life is due to the accumulation of accidents and not due to selection for difference. But we can talk about that another time. That's great. I'll look and if, if public either send me the references because I just I didn't recognize the work I was looking at. Um, uh, it's Blair Hedges, right? Am I going to get it? Blair Hedges at Temple, um, it, who had sort of written that uh, sort of in the in the sort of the time clock of life that you basically see that you know two million years for most lineage is enough time to essentially create species yeah. entirely based on random mutation, and I, I was fairly influenced by, by coming across that evidence. The, the reference is our new book, which I'll shamelessly um, promote here, The Missing Two-Thirds of Evolution. Well, that's great. When, is that out? Yep. Oh, all right. So my embarrassment that I haven't seen no, it. No, it's just out. Oh, you just didn't out. be embarrassed at all. Has he given a talk yet about this? Uh, this it came, it came out post-COVID, so n nobody's traveling anywhere to give talks. Okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, you shouldn't say be shameless. Look at me. I mean, oh my God, what a, you know, I'm, I'm pimping a book that's four months away. I mean. Okay. But... I'm shy and retiring compared to you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a wonderful, a really wonderful discussion and, and questions. And I, I just want to take an opportunity. First of all, Sean, thank you for, uh, for coming and enlightening us today and really for the, for the Atlantic article and a cha sample chapter. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing. When is the Atlantic piece coming out, by the way? It'll be October also. Also October, uh, oh, the 50th anniversary. And um, I just want to reiterate, I, I really think that this group here, our EVMED uh, community, will, will really not only enjoy the book, but um, find it a useful tool. It, it's really a, a wonderful form of science communication and, and tackle some of the questions you're talking about today. I mean, you know, is it the mutation or selection that is the creator? I mean, that, that, those kinds of ideas are um, presented so clearly and accessibly. Uh, really, I, th I think even a smart secondary school student. I mean, it's, it's really, um, I, I think my undergraduates and um, I think it's just gonna be a, a, wonderful, um, a wonderful piece of, of just science communication and information on so many um, topics and, and uh, just, just bravo.
Um, in any event, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, Much appreciated. Do you know if there's any way to record the chat? Because I'd really like to look at these questions. Yeah, um, the chat is. Is there a way to download it, copy it? Yes, so the chat is recorded and I will be sending out a recording along with the chat to everyone that registered and attended the event. So you will have access to the chat very soon. That's great, I appreciate it because this is also a tester and I haven't taken this story, this thing out in public, let alone among expert peers. And uh, if everyone's okay, if I read some of these questions and I wanna follow up on it, I I'm sure I can sharpen you know, uh, discussion about these things um, more than you got today. <laughs> But, and thank you, I apologize for running over in the original presentation because I really wanted to, to spend most of the time in conversation, but uh, uh, oh shit, you got me started on my no and I just didn't get out of there fast enough. <laughs> yeah, thank so you very much, John, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, this was uh, fantastic and it was a very active conversation in the chat. So I hope, uh, hope you'll have a chance to take a look at that. Um, I just want to uh, mention a couple things before we, uh, before we end. First of all, we have a great lineup of additional speakers. Next week, we have Randy Nessie, who's gonna be speaking. After that, the week after that, we have Jenny Tung, Noah Snyder-Mackler, and Dan Belsky, who are gonna be talking about their recent science paper, Social Determinants of Health. Uh, I think that's gonna be a really fantastic conversation as well. Then we have Bernie Crespi, and he's gonna be talking about bacterial selection. And I, I will uh, leave it to a, a better description that we will send around shortly about that. And then finally, we have on the agenda, we have uh, Verena Schooneman from uh, University of Zurich. And I saw that you were on, Verena. Thanks for joining today. And uh, she'll be talking about ancient DNA and uh, historical patterns of disease. And then finally, I just want to uh, again uh, recommend that everyone urge everyone. Oh. Charlie? We lost you, Charlie. So I think what he was going to recommend was joining uh, ISEMF, uh, getting involved through the newsletter or becoming a member. Um, and the link is in the chat, which will be passed around with the uh, recording as well. Uh, so thank you again to uh, Sean and to Barbara for, for hosting this. And thank you all for attending. I'll send out the recording soon. Wonderful.